Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. So good morning, afternoon, evening, um, no matter where you're joining us from today. We're so happy to have you here. And whether or not this is your first session of the day or you were able to join the earlier events, you know, we're just so happy to have you here today. This is the Fueling Action on Clean Cooking session. My name is Hannah Chi. I am your moderator for today. For just some quick background information on me, I am with the Clean Cooking Alliance. I work on demand generation and behavior change activities um, to help generate demand for clean cooking solutions. So before I dive into the session today, I'll just go over a few logistics. One, um, we wanna note that all participants are muted today. So if you have a question, you can go ahead and submit it via the chat box. And you can submit questions throughout the session, but we will be leaving time at the end um, for the Q&A panel with our speakers. So if you submit a question to the chat box, feel free to just include your name and what country you're joining us from. And then of course, um, if your question is directed at a particular speaker, please also let us know in the chat box. If you also have any colleagues that weren't able to join the session today, no worries, we'll, we will be recording the session and circulating the link afterwards. And then finally, one other thing I'll just say, if you see me looking down at my phone, um, it's just to communicate with our tech lead on the back end or to monitor the chat box. So maybe with that, let's go ahead and get started. So Al, if you don't mind opening up the polls, right now what we wanted to do, we just wanna do a quick icebreaker with everyone um, with just some few polling questions. So there's four questions that will be popping up on the screen. So we'll give everyone a few minutes to go through them. So first off, what part of the world are you joining us from? Um, the second question is, how old are you? The third question is, what cooking appliance do you use the most? And we know folks use a variety of different appliances, so feel free to just check off the one that you use most frequently. And then the last question is, how much do you know about clean cooking? So I'll just give everyone a couple of minutes to answer those questions. Okay, great. So it looks like we have um, representation from pretty much everywhere. It looks like we have a lot of attendees from Sub-Saharan Africa, also from Europe and North America. In terms of how old people are, okay, it looks like the majority of people are between the ages of 25 to 30, but kudos, I also see some people from 15 to 18 years old who are also joining the session. So welcome, we're so happy to have you here. Okay, in terms of what cooking appliance do you use the most, it looks like over 50% of us are cooking with a gas stove, but also I see some people also indicating microwave or electric appliance. Finally, how much do you know about clean cooking? Okay, it looks like everyone here has at least heard of it. Uh, we have a couple experts in our session with us today, um, but it looks like most people indicated that they were either familiar or know a lot about clean cooking. So that is a great place to start. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and dive into the session. Um, just to give you guys an overview of how the session will work. So I'm going to give some very, very brief um, remarks on just an overview about what clean cooking is, especially for those who may not be as familiar with it. And then we're going to be hearing from three, three speakers today. I'll be introducing each of them as we go, and then we'll leave some time at the end for Q&A. So, um, first off, I'm going to tell you guys, you know, what is clean cooking? And maybe I can best answer that by telling you what clean cooking is not. So globally, 3 billion people depend on polluting open fires or inefficient stoves. And this is due to a variety of reasons, but um, one being that a lot of people only have access to fuels that are inefficient in converting to energy. So this is things like wood, charcoal, coal, and kerosene. These are all considered fuels that are not efficient. And there's no need to memorize this chart, but I just thought it might be um, easier to explain it visually. So if you look at the left-hand side of this chart, you'll see that things like wood, um, cow dung, these are all considered um, inefficient fuels um, and they often lead to higher emissions. So we'll see things like open fires being commonly used in a lot of places in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, especially. As you move to the right of this chart, you'll see things like LPG, biogas, electric, and solar. These are all considered very clean fuels. Um, solar is, of course, a renewable energy. So when we talk about clean fuels and clean stoves um, for the rest of this presentation, just know that we're talking about um, the stoves and fuels you see on the right-hand side of this chart. 
So I also want to talk about access to clean cooking. So um, access differs by context and even within countries. So access rates can be as low as 22% in rural areas compared to highs of 78% in urban areas. So there's definitely a big urban rural divide that we see. One other thing that I wanna note is that 85% of those um, without access live in just 20 high impact countries. So I can show you some of those countries here. You'll see that there's a lot of dark green in Sub-Saharan Africa, and then also in some parts of Southeast Asia as well in Southern Asia. Um, so while clean cooking is a global issue, it definitely does affect some parts of the world more than others, and also some regions even within countries more than others. So why is clean cooking so important? So there's a couple of things that we wanna to touch upon today. So one, it has a lot of health implications. About 4 million people die prematurely every year from illnesses associated with exposure to smoke, from polluting open fires or inefficient stoves, and we often refer to this as household air pollution. And it is a leading risk factor for a variety of diseases such as childhood pneumonia, stroke, and even lung cancer. So of course, clean cooking is so important for having positive health outcomes across the globe. Uh, maybe what's of most interest to a lot of people here today is the impacts on the climate and the environment. So nearly 2.4 billion people rely on firewood and charcoal for cooking. And cooking over polluting open fires or inefficient stoves actually um, emits one quarter of all global black carbon emissions. And this is actually the second largest contributor to climate change after carbon dioxide. So it's really, really important um, to pay attention to clean cooking when we think about the environment. I also wanna talk about the impacts on gender and livelihoods. So lack of access to cooking fuel forces women and girls to travel as many as five hours every single day to collect cooking fuel. Um, as you can imagine, you know, having, being able to give girls and women five hours a day back in their day can have so many positive implications. You know, this will allow women to potentially pursue income generating activities outside the household, um, will allow girls to stay in school. So there's so many positive impacts on gender and livelihoods. So I also, you know, thought that I couldn't make this presentation today without talking or addressing the context that we're in today, which is, of course, COVID-19. So the clean cooking sector has also been affected by the pandemic, as has so many other sectors have been. So one, we've seen a lot of shifting government priorities, of course, as they um, think about COVID-19 relief. We've also seen a lot of supply chain disruptions um, in the clean cooking space. And of course, social distancing measures have um, disrupted a lot of efforts of maybe NGO-led programs or even government-led programs. And of course, when we look at the direct impact on households, uh, we know that a lot of people uh, may be experiencing more acute poverty due to the pandemic. And so this has led to a lot of people maybe shifting back to um, fuels such as charcoal or firewood. And especially as I've mentioned, kind of the disruptions on the supply chain, we've seen a lot of people who were once using LPG um, now having to revert back to things like charcoal or firewood. So for the last slide I have for you guys today, um, clean cooking is so important for a variety of sustainable development goals. But of course, today we're focusing on SDG 7. Um, and we just want to keep in mind that clean cooking is essential to addressing energy poverty and ensuring sustainable energy security for billions of people. So that is all the slides I have for you today. I want to now introduce you guys to our first speaker. And I'm going to use my cheat sheet to read, read his bio. But um, Isaac Mau, he is a project officer for I Choose Life Africa, a youth-focused organization that works to empower young people on matters related to the environment, economic empowerment, education, and sexual reproductive health, among so many other areas. Isaac holds an undergraduate degree in natural resource management from Egerton University and has been working in the community and social development sector with a focus on sustainable energy for over four years. So Isaac, the next eight minutes is all yours. Feel free to just let me know when you want me to move to the next slide. Isaac, are you able to hear us? We're not able to hear you. So, sorry, sorry. Isaac, hello? Hey, Hannah, uh, I had uh, some internet. Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yep, I can thank hear you, you so now. much. 
All right, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Isaac. I know Hannah has introduced me and I'm glad to be here today just to share with you my personal story. And besides sharing you my personal story, I also want to share the milestones that we've been able to make uh, with regards to transitioning and adoption of clean cooking solution. So a bit of my story. When I was growing up, uh, I grew up uh, back in our home, we used to cook using the open fire, as you can see. And uh, most of the time, I spent most of my time in the kitchen, either cooking for my siblings or helping my mother out. This, uh, this, uh, this had really made me, uh, anytime I went to school, I used to smoke smoke. I used to smell smoke on my uniform. And uh, my friends usually used to mock me, ridicule me, simply because I used to smell smoke. And besides that, uh, using, uh, through the open, open cooking cook stove, or rather the three stone jig, as we call them here, I, was, uh, I, I had itchy eyes uh, and also skin rash owing to some of the effects of that uh, open fire. Besides, I also, uh, I also felt sick more often, things like coughing and, and the like. Uh, all these were attributed to the method of cooking. But some quick facts, maybe Hannah, if you got, can go to the next slide. Some quick facts here. Hannah, maybe, yes, thank you. So exposure to smoke from, uh, smoke from traditional cook stove and open uh, fires causes uh, more than 16,500 deaths in Kenya every year. And 84% of Kenya's population relies on solid fuel for their household cooking needs. If you look at, at this statistic, I was part of this stati statistic, but I'm here today to ensure that the future generation is secured, that the future generation does not have to go through what I went through. That picture that you've seen in the previous slide is a photo that most of you can relate to, especially those in, uh, in Africa and in developing countries. And that should be the end of, of, of uh, other, another young person having to endure all this because uh, of lack of uh, clean cooking solutions that are accessible and available. The next slide, please, Hannah. Thank you so much. So my journey began when I was trained as a clean cooking champion by Choose Life Africa uh, through uh, funding by the, uh, by, from the Clean Cooking Alliance. I was trained to be a clean cooking uh, champion. We were taught on the different methods that are available, uh, the clean cooking solutions and also the important and the benefits of investing and adopting in clean cooking solutions. Next slide. So we were tasked, uh, we were tasked, next slide. So we were tasked to reaching out to, to young people, our stu uh, students in the schools. As you can see in that photo, that is me just trying to sensitize young children in the schools on the, uh, on the side effects or on the negative effects of household air pollution and also the need for us to adopt uh, the clean cooking solutions. Next slide. So once we trained these young students, the students in school, they were also able to reach out to, to their fellow peers through what we call the behavior change communication groups. Through these behavior changing, uh, change communication groups, they were able to pass knowledge on clean cooking and the, the importance of uh, adopting the clean cooking solutions in many ways. They, they did it through songs, they did, it, they did it through poems, and even art, as you can see in the next slide. This is a piece of art by the young people that we trained on clean cooking, just trying to ensure that they pass a message. Next slide, that they ensure that they pass uh, um, uh, the message on clean cooking to their peers. So you can see that is knowledge sustainability through art. Next slide. Thank you. So this, this, the students that we train, as you can see, it's a ripple effect. I was a victim. I was trained. I was empowered. After being empowered, I reached out to other people to empower them, the students. We empowered them. The students then reached out to their fellow students to empower them. And not only that, the students also reached out to their parents. As you can see in this photo, this is a parent to one of the trained seals that is making, that they were trained on basic artisan skills. And as you can see, they are making jikos. These jikos, they are able to, to, to sell them and make a profit, therefore putting their students in school. Next slide. Next slide, please. I think there's a lag. Is it showing up for you? 
No, it's not showing up for me. All right, thank you so much. Uh, it's it, it's up, it's up, uh, Hannah. So okay, we were also what one of the challenge one of the challenges that we also uh, recorded when we were we were we were we were in, uh, interacting with the community is that most of these people really wanted to adopt the clean cooking solutions, but these clean cooking solutions were not available, and even if they were, they were not uh, they were not accessible. So as you can see, these are village index shops. These are shops within the villages in the communities, just to ensure that. The, we, 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 take, we take these clean cooking solutions to the people in the village so that uh, they, they normally, for the village index shop, how it operates, they can take the JICO, then they pay in, in installments. So this, uh, this, this, this helps us or enables us to push for adoption of the clean cooking solutions. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we also did uh, community outreaches. We did market storms. We did we did church and uh, mosque storms just to ensure that we reach and we create awareness on the side effects. You see, uh, we, we've seen. Uh, if, if you've been able to join the previous session, if you've been able to join the previous session, you've been able to see. I hope you can hear me, Hannah. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've been able to see from the uh, different session, the statistics are really worrying. And if we are to achieve uh, the sustainable energy for all, then we need to do something. As you can see, that is a thematic activity. This one, this is an, one of the activities that we, 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 uh, we, we came up with just to ensure that we reach out to the community to ensure that they are able to adopt this clean cooking solution. For this particular event, we reached over 1,500 community members uh, with the message on clean cooking solution and fuels. Next slide, please. Next slide, Hannah. Yeah, Thank sorry, you. I think so, so all right, all right. Thank you so much. So as you can see from the community that we trained, they were able to come up with innovative ways of, uh, of how they can participate. Their role in ensuring that there is a transition from the traditional to the modern a cooking solution. Whatever you can see there is a chepkube. Chepkube is a traditional cook stove in Kenya, uh, among the famous among the Kalenjin community that is energy efficient. It doesn't produce smoke. And it has, of the three stones that you can see, one of it is, a, is actually a microwave to warm the food. Next slide. Thank you so much, Hannah. Even as I conclude, some of the achievements that we've been able to do is that we've been uh, we've been able to organize and participate uh, in the second Quadrahelix uh, summit. This was this was a summit that uh, it's a national forum that brought on board different stakeholders to push for for, for uh, and also to share the best practices on clean cook stove adoption and the strategies with a focus in policy development, distribution, and also production. We were also able to support over 155 households to adopt clean cooking solution through the village index shops. We also supported formation of eight in-school seal clubs. The clubs that we formed were basically for passing knowledge from a peer to a peer, from the students to the students. And we also synthesized over 12,872 youths, majority of them being the young people, because we believe the young people are the change agents, that the one who will spur change in adoption of clean cooking solution. And finally, we also advocated for budgetary increase uh, and allocation for sustainable cooking solution here in Wasingishu County. Thank you, Hannah. Next slide. Thank you. Some of the key learnings that we were able to, to, to take from uh, is that setting up of the village index shop really enhanced accessibility and affordability. As I had shared earlier, is that uh, most of these community members, they really wanted, they really wanted to, to purchase this uh, cook stove, but they, the, the cook stove are not available. They are not affordable. So the village index shop provided a solution by ensuring that they get this cook stove, they can, buy, they can get them at, a, at an installment and then pay on as they use the clean cook stove. And also involving the local administration, the religious leaders and the members of uh, uh, members, county members or the legislative members. Uh, really pushed for adoption and created an enabling environment for policies. When we 
talk about uh, clean cooking adoption, it really requires policies. For, for sustainability, we require to put in uh, policies that will enhance, that will support the adoption of clean cooking solution. Uh, the next slide. Next slide. Thank you so much. As I conclude, I would really want to appreciate your audience and also ask uh, the partners that are here, the, youth, the young people that are here, I'm requesting that if we can reach out to our young people, train them on clean cooking, uh, clean cooking solution and the need for adoption. And most importantly, the need for transitioning from the traditional cooking uh, methods to the modern one, the, the modern efficient cookstove. Hannah, at the beginning of this presentation, Hannah shared the, the transition from the three stone, uh, the open fire, all the way to the gas. That is the way, the, that is what, where we want to go. And this can only be achieved if, and only if we empower our young people to be change agents. And also we have to strengthen the supply of clean cooking solution through creating innovative distribution model. When we talk about uh, innovative distribution model, what we mean are things like the village index shop, make these cooking solutions affordable and accessible to the local, the, the local communities out there. And finally, uh, to support establishment of clean cooking stove, uh, community empowerment centers where the community members can walk in at any time and get materials that can enlighten them, that can enrich them and push them to, uh, to actually adopt the clean cooking solution. And also we have to support advocacy meeting. If we have to, if we have to, uh, to push for clean cooking adoptions, then policy, policy uh, and uh, uh, put in place policies that will indeed support adoption of clean cooking solution. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, I think I'm done with my presentation. Thank you so much. Back to you, Hannah. Great, thank you so much, Isaac. It was really incredible to hear all the work that you're doing at the community level um, and in schools. Um, so next we'll move to our next speaker. Um, so our next speaker is Charlotte Magai. So she is the founder and CEO of Makuru Clean Stoves in Kenya. She's been recognized globally and awarded for her fight against household air pollution and global poverty and her work to empower marginalized women in Western Kenya. Charlotte is a 2020 Echoing Green Fellow and she won the Wastelets Global Citizen Award in 2019, the World Bank's inaugural SDGs and in Her Award in 2018, and the AWIEF Empowerment Award in 2019. So we're super lucky to have Charlotte here. Um, one thing I'll just mention to um, to Charlotte and Jess, I think there's a big lag in my slides from when you tell me to move to the next slide to when it actually appears on the screen. So thank you in advance for your patience. Um, Charlotte, the floor is yours for the next eight minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Hannah. Could you kindly move to the next slide, please? Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Charlotte Magai, and I'm the founder and CEO of Mukuru Clean Stoves, which is a social enterprise that um, recycles waste metal to produce improved cook stoves for low-income households in, in Kenya right now, and hopefully um, other countries in East Africa. So what we do at Mukuru Clean Stoves is we partner with um, young uh, men and women and um, provide them with skills training on production of clean cook stoves and um, employ them as our artisans. And then we partner with local women business owners um, who sell our cook stoves um, at a 10% uh, commission um, for every unit that is sold. Um, so far we've sold about 40,000 click clean cook stoves around Western Kenya and some parts of Nairobi as well, um, because our target is um, rural areas and, and urban slums um, in Africa. Next slide, please. Um, so I think the vision with Mukuru Clean Stoves is to um, help in eradicating household air pollution within the next 10 years. So that is by um, 2030. And uh, Mukuru Clean Stoves is, you know, a women-led, managed and focused social enterprise, meaning, you know, from um, design to delivery, really, we work with women who are the users of our clean cook stoves to ensure that we are producing um, a, a stove or a product that meets the market 
basic needs of um, our customers. So we also work with microfinance institutions to provide um, you know, financing options for houses that are not able to um, maybe pay up $10 upfront up for um, our clean cook stores. And some of the benefits of using our uh, clean cook stoves, aside from the fact that it um, enables you to reduce household air pollution, is the fact that families are able to save up to $2 weekly on their fuel consumption costs. And the women that we work with as our business, um, as our sales agents are able to increase um, their household income by about $7 weekly. So ensuring that they're able to also provide better lives for their children. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just um, a bit of background on some of the people also um, in the same market. So there is um, Ban Manufacturing, EcoZoom and, and Scod, and Scod being our biggest competitor, meaning they provide um, the stove are pretty similar to the stove that we provide. Their, uh, um, their presence is also in Western Kenya and um, a little bit more affordable than we do, but this is just to show you that um, there is, you know, um, a market out there for clean cook stores for anyone on their call who would be, you know, looking to provide um, same solutions. Um, there is enough uh, market share. I think the goal for all of us is to get households to adopt clean cook stoves and just ensure that we all accelerate adoption at scale really, really fast to ensure that we kick out the problem by 2030. Next slide, please. Um, so we earn about a 40% uh, profit on our cook stoves because we use um, recycled metal, which are locally available. Um, our cook stoves are assembled here in Kenya. It means it's super, super affordable to build them. Our cook stoves cost about $10 um, per household. And this ensures that even a household that earns about $40 to $100 monthly income are able to access our clean cook stoves, which is really the goal to ensure that there is accessibility, but also um, affordability. Next slide, please. Um, so most of our customers are women um, in rural areas, so coming from low-income households, um, about the ages of 17 to sometimes even 50 years old. All of these households, or at least 90% um, of them, rely on solid fuel in traditional stoves to cook. And uh, most of their money is spent on basic needs with a third of their household income being spent on fuel consumption. So this is buying charcoal um, um, or briquettes or even ker kerosene. And on average, these are women, very young families, they have maybe three children. So this, um, what this really means is aside from the fact that we want to ensure that they get um, energy efficient cook stoves, we also want to ensure that the women who are selling them are able to improve the lives of their children and maybe even they increase their um, household income. Next slide, please. Um, next slide, sorry. Um, so um, this is um, our team and uh, basically we're showing this to um, show you that all of the people that work um, at Mukuru Clean Stoves are, um, are Kenyan. Some of us have gone through the problem. And um, for instance, I grew up in Mukuru, which is the reason why it's called Mukuru, even though we operate from Western Kenya. And I witnessed some of the impacts of household air pollution first and, and my daughter got burned by a traditional stove. So when I set out to build a team, I wanted to build a team that was ensuring that they were solving the problem and not just focusing on the profit that they could make. So it is an impact fast business um, that is run by mostly young women um, um, around Kenya who know what um, just the health, the health impacts of, um, you know, household air pollution and the benefits of using um, um, clean cooking. We also work with um, our advisory bodies filled with, um, again, other people who may have already invested in the clean cooking sector, who have a bit of, you know, experience in scaling um, a business such as ours, or maybe some of them who may have, or, um, you know, 
have invested in Africa or have invested in Mukuru Clean Stoves itself. So far, the number of staff that we have, well, was 18 until we started doing a scale-up project. So now we have 23 people um, on our team. Our management team is 100% female um, and 100% um, on the management team also, you know, local. We have young people on board. So it's about between 20 to um, 41 years. Um, next slide, please. Um, so some of our key partners are, like I said, women business owners are the primary distributors of our clean cook stoves. So Mukuru Clean Stoves itself is not a distributor, we just manufacture. And we ensure that women um, are the ones who distribute our clean cook stoves because they are the ones hardest hit by the impacts of household air pollution. So we just want to ensure that if there is a solution, they're the ones profiting from it. And because there are some households that are not able to afford cook stoves out up front, we partner with microfinance institutions and women savings groups to ensure that they have a staggered payment plan to uh, get the cook stove in their households in good time. And sometimes even supermarkets in areas where um, there are not too many um, you know, small business owners. Next slide, please. Um, so I think um, some of the impact that we have seen so far, just with um, what we've done, I think uh, since um, the year began, we've sold about 10,000 more cook stoves. So that goes, uh, takes up to um, um, 40,000 clean cook stoves. And the GHC emissions that we've been able to reduce are about 60,000 with 150,000 or um, in this case, about 200,000 people benefiting from cleaner air in their homes. So these are young, young, uh, young children, um, you know, people living in a household who are able to just benefit from cleaner air because they're using um, a better cook stove. We have been able to partner with 100 women sales agents with each and every one of them seeing a $7 increase in their um, household income. Right now, we're trying to get our clean cook stoves to about 100,000 households um, within Kenya um, by 2023 and hopefully um, move out of Kenya as well and bring our solution to other countries. And um, with Vision 2030, uh, we want to get into 10 um, African countries uh, by the time this decade of action is over. Um, thank you all very much. Again, my name is Charlotte Magai from Mukuru Clean Stoves. Great, thank you so much, Charlotte. Um, it's really inspiring to hear how you guys have been able to include women in the process and you guys have an all-female management team. So that's amazing to hear. Next, we're gonna move to our last speaker of today. Um, her name is Jessica Borby. She is the Advocacy and Communications Associate for the Clean Cooking Alliance. Jess is responsible for promoting CCA's work and messages across various social and digital media platforms and supports the implementation of digital communication strategies, develops creative collateral, and promotes sector-wide and programmatic research. Jessica attended William Smith College where she studied media communications and women's studies. She is also a member of the SC for All Youth Summit Task Force. So she is one of the people um, that we can thank for making this whole event happen. So Jess, the floor is yours for the next eight minutes. Great, thanks Hannah. Um, so as Hannah mentioned, um, hi everyone. My name is Jessica, I'm the Advocacy and Communications Associate with the Clean Cooking Alliance. And so um, my main responsibilities are really managing the Clean Cooking Alliance's social media accounts. Um, as well as writing press releases and blog posts and newsletters and other email marketing messages. Um, but today I'm going to talk to you about the Clean Cooking News campaign, which is a global adv advocacy campaign that we launched in 2019 at the Clean Cooking Forum in Nairobi. And the main call to action behind this campaign is for people to finish the phrase clean cooking is with what clean cooking really means to them. And so the main motivation behind creating this campaign was before we launched it, there were no advocacy movements within the global development or the health or energy access communities that had been um, designed to exclusively focus on clean cooking. And with social media and online communications continuing to grow in popularity and importance, um, what seems like every day, creating this campaign was definitely a main priority for us. Um, global advocacy and awareness raising campaigns such as this are really the next big thing 
in communicating with the public, with donors, with anyone outside of your organization, really. And that's especially true for um, nonprofit and um, global development organizations where public support and donors are so crucial to your mission. And you may not even realize the impact that social media or online campaigns have already had on you or the public or the world. And, you know, for an example, I'll talk about organizations that focus on these really, really global well-known issues such as malaria or HIV and AIDS or, or hunger or poverty. You know, all of these organizations have successfully marketed these challenges as ones that you should care about. And you really should care about them, but you know there are so many global challenges. How have these risen to be so, some of the most well known? And that's really because of their successful advocacy campaigns that have just taught me and knew so much about them. So mm -hmm. successful social and digital media campaigns can really lead to increased awareness on certain issues, mm -hmm. um, increased support from the public, as well as more investment. And that's exactly why we launched the Clean Cooking News campaign. And so Hannah, you can go ahead and play the video. What does cooking have to do with protecting the climate? A lot, it turns out. Did you know that if we transformed how people in developing countries cook, we could dramatically reduce climate harming emissions? Some 3 billion people around the world still depend on food cooked over polluting open fires or inefficient stoves. Without access to cleaner options, families must use wood, charcoal, and other fuels to cook filling homes with dangerous levels of smoke while causing serious harm to the climate and environment. How can we tackle climate change while building a better future for people and planet? The answer is simple. Clean cooking. Clean cooking is more than preparing food using cleaner, more modern stoves and fuels. It's also a proven and critical part of the climate solution helping reduce black carbon emissions by as much as 90%. Join Julia Roberts, Chef Jose Andres, the Clean Cooking Alliance, and other champions of the Clean Cooking Is campaign to tell world leaders why clean cooking must be a priority. Whether it's cleaner air, greener cities, or a healthier planet, we want to know what clean cooking means to you. Find out more at cleancooking.is. Awesome, thank you, Hannah, for playing that. Um, so one of the main goals behind the Clean Cooking Is campaign is to really highlight just how impactful transitioning to cleaner and more modern fuels can be and that it's so much more than just cooking. So the video we just watched is definitely very climate change focused, um, but as we heard from Hannah and Isaac and Charlotte, you know, clean cooking can have so many impacts, it can lead to healthier lives, it can empower women and children, that can mitigate deforestation and support environmental preservation. So, you know, clean cooking, supporting clean cooking is really supporting an incredibly wide range of global solutions. And we wanted to make sure that people understood that. So Hannah, you can go to the next slide. So we really liked this idea of users being able to customize this campaign to fit their needs or interests because clean cooking doesn't necessarily mean the same thing to everyone. Um, so we created a collection of social media share graphics that all touch on different positive impacts. And so on the screen are a few of them. So, you know, you have clean cooking is healthier mothers and healthier families. Clean cooking is survival, it's empowerment. It can be, you know, whatever you want it to be. Um, and this gave a very uh, intimate or personal feel to the campaign and that we're not trying to tell you what clean cooking means or how you should feel about it. Instead, you have um, you can create your own clean cooking story and choose from dozens of pre-made graphics to promote what is really important to you. Um, and then we want to take that even a step further um, and we encourage users to go beyond our pre-made graphics and actually share what clean cooking means to them with their own words. And they can do this by posting a video on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or any other social media platform. Um, and they can use that video to um, tell the world what clean cooking means to them with their own voice. And that really gives users the power to speak directly to the global development community or even the greater online community. Um, and so to give you an example of this, Hannah, you can go to the next slide and um, play the video as well. Clean cooking is the opportunity for women and men alike to access, adopt, and afford life-saving technologies. Clean cooking is healthier children and happier families. 
Clean cooking is market forces changing the world. Clean cooking is greater economic opportunity. Clean cooking is fundamental if we want to address climate change and air pollution. Clean cooking is the future. Clean cooking is clean air and healthy lives. Clean cooking is protecting our planet for the next generations. Clean cooking is less time spent collecting firewood and more time spent with family. Clean cooking is an exciting sector to work in. Awesome, and then Hannah, you can actually go to the next slide as well. So while social media campaigns have the potential to be incredibly impactful, they're also, you know, they can be a bit challenging um, or a bit hard to implement. You really need to plan what your main messages will be and how you wanna promote those messages and who you want reading those messages. So in this slide, I have a basic outline how to create a successful social media campaign. So the first um, step is to define your activities and goals. And this is really kind of asking yourself, why are you creating this campaign and what are your intentions or what are your main focus points? Um, it's really important to outline what you want your campaign to look like before you even start or else it's really easy to create a, a disorganized or a missionless campaign. So for us with the Think Cooking Is campaign, we decided our main goals um, would be showcasing the diverse range of clean cooking benefits as well as elevating a diverse range of voices from around the world. We didn't want to be the ones sharing the stories. We really wanted to feel like people from around the world had a voice. Um, the next one is to determine what you're measuring. And this is incredibly important, especially um, if social media is going to be a key focus for your campaign. There are so many different ways to measure online communication. We have impressions, engagements, reach, likes, comments, retweets, there are so many. So it's really important to research what each of these metrics is actually measuring. And you can just do that you know, through a simple Google search, but to also determine what measurements mean um, the most important to you. So for us, we decided to focus on impressions and engagements. So impressions are the total number of times um, one of our posts shows up on someone's social media timeline. Um, and because we were trying to reach as many people as possible, we, saw, we, we thought that you know, the more eyes on our posts, the better. But we also wanted to focus on engagements because, you know, while having our posts appear on someone's timeline is definitely a step in the right direction, we felt that the number of people actually engaging with that post, so clicking on it, expanding it, really reading the content was a good measure of how strong or how impactful our mes messages actually were. And the next is to research your target audiences. Um, and this is key for when you're actually developing the, the messaging or the language or, or the words you're gonna use to promote your campaign. Um, and this is really important because the way that you might design a campaign to capture the attention of people like us in the youth demographic might look very different than a campaign directed at someone in their 40s or their 50s. And that's really because of these, you know, undeniable generational differences in how we speak, the ways that we use social media, as well as just our knowledge and comfortability with certain technologies or certain platforms. So TikTok, for example, is an overwhelmingly, uh, it's an overwhelming teenager and young adult platform. Whereas, you know, Facebook or LinkedIn might be more industry focused and entrepreneurial. So, you know, you have to keep in mind those generational differences as well as those platform differences. Um, and so for us, we, knew from the get-go that we wanted to focus not only on people who were already working in or familiar with the clean cooking sector, but those in adjacent sectors, such as maybe sustainable energy or gender and women's empowerment or global health. So it was super helpful knowing this from the beginning because we knew that we had to craft our messages and our language in a very inclusive way. Because um, at any given point, we had to assume that there were going to be a number of people reading our content that had never heard of clean cooking. But at the same time, there might be people reading it who have, um, who had prior knowledge of clean cooking or are very familiar with it. So we are constantly trying to walk that fine line of creating messages that can really appeal to diverse groups of people. And that's been incredibly beneficial throughout the process of this campaign. And finally, um, it's really important to decide what success looks like from the very beginning. So that way you can look back in six months or a year or two years or whatever time interval you decide and be able to clearly see if what you're doing is working. Um, and so this is really a chance for you to kind of take a step back or zoom out and ask yourself, why am I doing this? Why do I, what do I want to get out of this? So for us with the Clean Cooking Is campaign, we decided to measure success by three things. And that's the number of campaign partners, 
um, greater awareness on the issue of clean cooking and increased investment. So for the number of campaign partners, um, that's a, definitely a little more easy to measure. And we've continuously seen increases every quarter, um, which we are incredibly happy about and very proud of. And from the other two, um, they're definitely a bit harder to measure on a quantifiable level. So we're constantly working with our monitoring and evaluation team to measure awareness levels. Um, and we do this by looking at our engagements and our impressions on a month to month basis. And we can be able to see like, oh, you know, this month we had really good engagement. And maybe that's because there was a certain moment like a World Environment Day or International Women's Day where we really connected with our audience very well. Um, and for increased investment, we've definitely seen very positive progress in the sector financially. So an example, um, the largest private equity deal to date was just made this last year in 2020 with a company called Circle Gas acquiring another company called Copatech, who's a pioneer in pay-as-you-go cooking technology. And pay-as-you-go cooking technology is super cool and uses a smart meter technology that allows energy users to only really pay for what they need or what they use. And so we've used this campaign to promote these success stories. Um, and we've definitely seen a lot of great and positive feedback from our partners and other stakeholders in the sector. And so overall, the point I think I would really love for you all to take away from this today is that a successful social media campaign takes research and planning. That's not something that you can just launch without putting in work beforehand. But at the same time, because of the intimate and instantaneous uh, nature of social media and other forms of online communication, it's, it's really important to still be genuine because you know, generally speaking, most people really do want to help. They want to do good and make the world a better place. Um, and social media is a really powerful tool that can bring groups of people together and actually accomplish that positive change. Um, and so we're really seeing that in the clean cooking sector and with the clean cooking this campaign for sure. And um, with that, I can hand it back over to Hannah. Great, thanks so much, Jess. It's awesome to see those videos. Um, they were really fun to do and um, engage a lot of different people. So it's great to see that work. So now we have about 10 minutes or a little less than 10 minutes to move um, into our Q&A panel. So we've had quite a few questions coming through the chat box. So maybe I'll start. I do have a question for Isaac. Um, so we know that um, I Choose Life has been instrumental in helping a lot of families transition to clean cooking. So a question that um, a participant na named Ben asked, um, he asked how many households are still using these stoves um, after they purchased it? You know, are they still using these stoves, you know, one, two, or even three years after they initially purchased it? Thank you so much, Hannah. Uh, uh, if, if I could hear clearly the question is that after we, get, we, we help them adopt the stoves, how many are still using those stoves? Yes. All right, thank you so much. So just, just for clarity, when we, when we stepped in to help or to push for the adoption of clean cook stoves, we had over 500 households, actually to be more precise, 510 households using traditional cooking methods. Where our main goal uh, was to ensure that the 30% of those households uh, uh, transition from the traditional cooking methods to the modern and the clean cooking solution and fuels. So after we have done that, what we normally do, we have follow-up visits to ensure that for those that, are, those that we, we, we supported to adopt these cook stoves, number one, are the, uh, are the clean cook stoves uh, in, in, in the right or perfect condition? Because again, if they are not, we are risking them. Remember the reason as to why we moved from open fires was the risks or were the risks that were involved in using open fires, fires or the traditional cooking methods. So uh, currently we've been able to track, uh, out of the 155, we've been able to track 76 and we are still, we are still making a follow-up on the same. So 76, we've been able to track them and we, we, can, we, can, uh, we can say that the, the, the adoption uh, has really taken shape in Wasingishu County. Great, thanks so much, Isaac. Um, so now we have a question for Charlotte, and this question is from Jasmine. She asked, did you do a life cycle assessment on the production of cooked stoves? I'm curious about the process of how the metal was recycled and the energy needed to transform it. Sorry, um, 
I think what she's asking, uh, I guess, is um, what I'm getting from the question is what kind of um, the material that we use um, to build the stove. And this is just recycled metal in the sense that some of the oil that is brought into the country are brought in using metal barrels and then which are later thrown away. So we use that. And um, then we use also um, uh, clay and sometimes cement and mecolite. Mecolite is just a special type of sand to build the stove. So that is the production process. And the, uh, the lifespan of the cook stove is uh, about three years. Great, thanks Charlotte. Um, a question for Jess. So Jess, why do you think social media has been such an effective tool in galvanizing social and environmental change, particularly among youth? I think what's so special about social media is it really kind of takes away these geographical boundaries that separate us based on country or continent. So, you know, e even this right now is a great example. You know, maybe some people might not consider Zoom as like a social media platform, but the fact that we have a group of people here from all over the world able to really connect and talk about solutions and talk about these issues um, is definitely a, a relatively new uh, development in the global development and you know um, the sectors that are working to kind of tackle some of these greater global challenges. So it, it connects people who think alike and want to do good for the world instantaneously. I think that's something that's super powerful. Great. Thanks, Jess. Um, another question for Isaac. So um, does ICL plan on expanding the SEALs clubs to other counties in Kenya? Thank you so much for that question. Uh, for those that are new, or for those that are coming uh, across the, the term SEAL for the first time, SEAL, uh, SEAL are, are the empowered young people. SEAL are, are, are people, uh, if we, be, we, we, we borrow this from the US Navy SEALs, they are trained young people that are trained all around to ensure that they can uh, they, they are ready to face any challenge that comes uh, along. Now, back to the question uh, on whether a seal is planning to uh, uh, to expand to other counties. Yes, uh, currently in Kenya we we are in three counties that is Machakos, Uasin-Gishu, and Nairobi, but we ho we look forward to to extending to many more other counties with enabled funding. Of course, with enabled funding, we can reach out to more counties because our goal here, our aim here is to ensure that we, we make clean cooking uh, uh, solutions and fuels accessible and available for all. Great, thanks, Isaac. Another question for Charlotte. Um, this person's asking, how do you see the opportunities of researchers in collaborating with your organization? So if you can just speak to any collaboration that you guys have done with maybe research organizations or institutions, that would be great to hear. Um, I think the only um, institution that we've worked with um, in terms of, you know, research purposes would be the University of Nairobi so far. And that would be, you know, when we were doing our stove testing and just um, trying to get into the space of, you know, getting carbon credits and, and such. But we are welcome to, you know, having more partnerships um, in terms of just helping us ensure that we are providing, you know, the best or the most effective clean cook stoves because we always want to, you know, improve the stove, innovate to ensure that by the time you know we are we get it to maybe outside of east africa then it's a way better stuff than it is right now so we are open to that great thanks charlotte and just one last question for you so what's next for the clean cooking is campaign yeah that's actually a great question because when we first launched it one of our main objectives was to utilize um you know global events like cop and um, you know, the UN General Assembly, but because of COVID-19, obviously those have changed a lot. Um, but I think this sort of virtual convening is, um, you know, maybe a, a blessing in disguise that we're now creating events that are much more accessible. People don't have to travel. Um, and that gives us the opportunity to hear from a lot more people. Um, and so I think we're really going to try to take advantage of these virtual events um, to connect with people and find out um, what clean cooking means to them um, and what their thoughts are on, on the sector and, and where we can progress and where we can do more work. Um, and these might be, would not have had the chance to connect with if it hadn't been for this rise in virtual events. Great. 
Thanks, Jess. So that was the end of our Q&A. We're coming up to the end of our session. So I really just wanted to thank you all for your insightful questions and for your participation today. I think conversations like these are is what's going to help us reach SDG 7 of sustainable energy for all by 2030. So um, a big thank you to all of our speakers, Isaac, Charlotte, and Jess. Um, thank you so much for being here today. I also wanted to thank Ayal, who's been our tech lead on the back end, who's been making sure that the session has been running smoothly. I also wanted to thank our colleague, Megan, who's been monitoring the chat box for questions. Um, and I also wanted to thank our sponsors, um, the Clean Cooking Alliance and M1 Energy Solutions. So thank you all for being here today. There's a lot more sessions in the next few days that we hope you'll join. Um, but with that, I'm gonna close today's session and thank you again so much. Have a great day, everyone.